The diffraction of a wave requires some approximation. And in the far field, where you're at least 10 wavelengths away from the source, the Fraunhofer approximation provides one of those very useful descriptive approximations. I'll draw two vertical lines in a horizontal line, and I'm going to do some geometry. Connecting this point on the left to this a point on the right, length r and angle theta relative to the horizontal axis. Now another line is in this picture which converges at the same point out here. It has a length of little r, so the angle that it makes relative to the horizontal is a little bit different. Call it theta prime. This distance is y. The Fraunhofer approximation recognizes a similarity between these two angles and a similarity between these two lengths. Now if you apply the law of cosine to this triangle, will solve for one length, little r, in terms of the other two lengths, big R and y. And cosine of the angle opposite to little r. Quick simplification. I recognize that cosine of 90 minus theta is sine of theta. Calling y over r x, just for simplicity, I can write out a Taylor series expansion of this radical that solves for little r over big R. Where the differentiation is with respect to x. I'll let you do those derivatives and simplify the expression to get r divided by r is approximately 1 minus y over r sine theta plus where the approximation is when you cut off higher order terms. I like to write this in terms of r by itself. I'll do it up here. So bringing the big R over to the right hand side. And we have an approximation for this distance, little r, in terms of big R and theta and y. Big R is usually what you can most easily know because it's referenced to a known place, which is depicted as an origin here. The Fraunhofer approximation usually keeps these two terms. If you keep a higher order term, you just get more precision. But this typically handles the precision that is needed to produce the famous Fraunhofer diffraction pattern. And sometimes this is done in the paraxial limit, where sine of theta is set equal to tangent of theta. And this length out here to the point where we're looking, divided by the distance to the screen, is then used as the sine of theta. Now let's turn to our optics problem. I have a block that is not transparent to light. Perhaps it's a card. And it has a slit cut into it of width b. The long edge of the slit is into the screen, so b is a narrow edge. But light is incident on that slit, and it goes through the slit and projects onto a projection screen way out here at the right. The screen technically should be spherical to get a focused image on it. The screen is a distance l away from the slit and is much, much larger than the size of the slit. So I'll show a ray of light projecting from the center of the slit of distance r to the screen and making the angle theta. Let's look at another ray of light which comes from the slit and lands at the exact same place. That ray has to travel a distance little r which is approximately but not quite the same as big R and is at an angle that is approximately the same as theta. Divide the slit up into a lot of little differential elements dy where y is the vertical coordinate. And we're going to add things up, so hence the use of a differential so we can integrate. And also in the width of the slit B, we have a lot of point sources. In fact, we have n point sources. The n is a very large number. This contains a very, very large number of point sources which represent the wave that is passing through it. And inside of each one of these differential elements, dy, there are several point sources. The light on the screen is represented by the electric field arriving at the screen. And we'll use the spherical wave description because of the fact that the slit is so much smaller than the distance to the screen. So we'll write this as uh, amplitude divided by r, that distance that's traveled. And then it's a propagating wave, so includes sine of omega t minus kr. What you see up here represents the contribution from each point source that is in the slit. And remember, there are n point sources, just a lot of them. 
And so we have to multiply this still by the number of point sources in the differential element dy. And now we have a differential for the electric field on the screen as a result of the light passing through not the whole slit, but just the portion of the slit of width dy. The number of point sources contained in that differential element of length is the total number of point sources in the slit times the dy length of that segment divided by b, the total width of the slit. All of those numbers can be put together to make a differential for DE. But there are some approximations that can be made because if we want to integrate this over R, we have a pretty serious job ahead of us. At this point, then, we bring in Fraunhofer. There are two approximations that need to be talked about. One is what do you do with R in the denominator, and the other is what do you do with R inside the sign. Two different things, in fact, because the expression has different sensitivities to those R's. DE is much more sensitive to R inside the sinusoid than it is to R in the denominator. So we will replace R in the denominator just with big R, which is a constant. But the R in the sinusoid needs to be treated more carefully. So let's replace that with big R minus Y sine of theta the first two terms in the expansion. Putting those arguments in there and putting an integral sign in front gives the electric field on the circular screen at a given point. So replacing little r with big R. Integration is over dy, so integration is over the source, not over the screen, meaning that theta can be treated as a constant because we are asking what is the electric field at a particular point on the screen defined by theta. So this is actually a very simple integral to solve. All you have to do is integrate over y. I'll allow you to do that integral. and evaluate that result from y equals minus b over 2 to y equals plus b over 2. Invoke the trig identity, that cosine of two arguments added together is u is omega t minus k big R, and v is k b over 2 sine of theta. These are things you'll see when you perform this evaluation. When you use this trigonometric identity to perform this evaluation, you will end up with four terms, two of which cancel and two of which are identical. And I'll write the result. This is the two that accounts for the fact that we have two surviving identical terms. And that's a valid final expression for the electric field at a point on the screen, defined by angle theta. It's worth a, one more little change to simplify it a little bit further. You do that by multiplying this expression by 1, and my choice of 1 today is b divided by b. And furthermore, give a nickname to what's inside this sign, just call it beta. Should use approximately. And so now this kr sine of theta over this surviving b go together to give you a beta in the denominator which if you're reading the textbook by half, this is the equation 1015. And that's an expression for the electric field on the screen at an angle theta. It's a time-dependent expression. And so as far as your vision is concerned, the sign is not helpful. So an averaging should be taken. And well, let's talk about power then, because that's what your retina detects. So we have the irradiance, which is watts per meter squared. You can write that in terms of the electric field because the irradiance I is certainly proportional to the average electric field squared, indicated as a time average that way. The time average of this expression is just this coefficient squared. Sine beta over beta is sinc of beta. Whenever you have proportionality, there's a proportionality constant. Intensity is whatever the intensity is when theta, hence beta, is zero times the sinc squared. And this is the Fraunhofer diffraction pattern, which is more appropriately written put in a red box to indicate its importance. The maxima and minima of this expression are quite telling. Let's find that. It's a minimum whenever beta is an integer multiple pi. We use the letter m. And it's a max, not simply halfway in between those values of beta. You have to be a little careful. Take the derivative to find out where's the maximum. 
using the product rule, set that derivative equal to zero. That's differentiating the sine, and now differentiate the one over beta. I think you can quickly see that what we have going on here is sine of beta over beta equals beta, which is easily solved. You can use your calculator or look up the tangent. And at those places, it's zero. That will help me to quickly sketch out a graph of the function. Looks like a sinc squared. And we know where the zeros are. We just determined that they're zero at integer multiples of pi. And we know where the maxima are. We just determined what they are down here, these zeros. And if you remember what a diffraction pattern looks like when a laser beam goes through a slit, it looks like a Fraunhofer diffraction pattern. This, in fact, is a graph of irradiance versus position along a screen. It's not just used in optics. It's also valid, for example, in superconductivity. If you look at the response of a Josephson junction's critical current to a static magnetic field, that looks like a Fraunhofer diffraction pattern as well. So it shows up in any place where waves might be interfering throughout optics and quantum mechanics.